glass is shrunk. Yeah. Where's Alice? Probably looking for Mel. She couldn't find him last Sunday. Well, Uncle Butch won't try to be here tonight. He is not feeling well this morning. She he woke up, he was coughing stuff that was not good coming out. Yeah. He, I don't know if he's got the stomach bug. He don't know what he's got. Okay. Yeah. You have to say a prayer for Butch. <laughs> So, Brother Ed, would you open us in a word of prayer? Dear God, thank you for this time we have to learn more about your word. We uh, pray that we absorb the knowledge that we learn here today and take it out in the world to lead others to Christ. Thank you for everything you've given us, Lord. We must all for Jesus. In his blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen. Open up your Bibles. chapter. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted on, counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. The reason I read that, that ties right into the ending part of the lesson. As a really quick review of what we did last week, what was what was what would be discussed last week? We looked at a timeline to prove that the gospels were written shortly after Jesus uh, went to heaven. What page? We're on page 64, Ruth. Thank you. And uh, because there are many skeptics that claim that the Gospels were written long after, long after uh, Jesus ascended, which gives credence to uh, legends and well, with the legend, things just get added to it that really aren't true. Correct. Now, the verse of scripture that I read, how does that correlate with what we are discussing this week in our lesson? Does anybody know? We're we looking at corroboration, are we? Um, we're actually going to finish up on the sick. We're actually going to finish up where they present. They present. And then we'll kind of continue, do a continuation on. The well, the, the scripture reference that you read deals with Abraham. Mm -hmm. And who else does it have to be? Well, Jesus, of course. 
And um, but Paul is doing the writing. Mm -hmm. You're on the right track on that. So even though Abraham had been had gone for centuries, anybody else have anything? Well, verse twenty three ties it to us. What's that? Verse twenty three ties it to us. Correct. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody else? There's a little more I want to pull out of this. Brother David, you're looking wise this morning. <laughs> no, just be here to one who sees that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. How about that verse of scripture was done and written in an orderly fashion. Yeah. Who wrote the book of who wrote that book? Paul. Okay. Who do who were they present at the time of Christ? Who was present at the time of Christ? Well Paul was, but he didn't he didn't see Jesus. Correct. Um, but he was present. He was present. And Romans was written. Well, excuse me, Paul, if I remember correctly, it was about three years, four years after Jesus ascended that he was uh, approached by Christ on the road to Damascus because it wasn't very long after he began to write and to preach here's a question though when he went to Arabia where did he get his teaching at? He went to Arabia. Does, he wasn't there three years, was he? He was there three years. I thought he was there like three and a half, four years. Well, okay, but where did he get his teaching from? Because he was by himself. And then when he came back, he shows up in Jerusalem. Was it, is that where he went? Mm -hmm. Okay, so he approaches uh, James, Jesus' brother. And then Peter. And, but still, where did he get his teaching from? Because James and Peter weren't teaching him. He was by himself. That's what I'm getting at. That's what I'm getting at. That's exactly Did what he it got was. the same time frame of training as the other apostles that walked with him. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's another, yeah. The three years that they walked with Jesus. Now, Brother Joe, look up Galatians chapter 1, 15 through 19. Brother David, can you look up Galatians 2, 1? Galatians 1, 15 through 19. Yep. All right. Go ahead when you got it. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned once more. Oh, okay, so he went to Damascus. Then, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, 
and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any of the, any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Brother David, Galatians 2, 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. Now, as we read in Galatians, and what we read last week at 1 Corinthians 15. Mm -hmm. In AD 33, Jesus was resurrected from the grave and ascended to heaven. AD 34-35, Jesus appeared to Paul while Paul was on the road to Damascus one or two years after the resurrection and ascension. In A.D. 37 through 38, somewhere in that area, Paul received the data about the, his, the his, history, city, and deity of Jesus from Peter and James. <laughs> While visiting them in Jerusalem two or three years after his conversion, depending on how you interpret the words, three years later, now, AD 48 through 50, Paul corroborates the data about the history, city, and deity of Jesus with John, Peter, and James in the presence of Barnabas and Timothy, 14 years after the Damascus Road event, or 14 years after the first meeting with Peter and James in Jerusalem. AD 51. Paul first provides data to the Corinthian church about the history city and the deity of Jesus. During his visit to Corinth, he also appeared before Galileo. <clears throat> AD 55, Paul writes the Corinthian church and reminds them of the data he previously provided them about the history city and deity of Jesus. The early Christian creed related to the history, city, and deity of Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15 is actually a written record of the earliest <coughs> transmitted data we have about Jesus. I find that interesting. As I was studying for this, I found that verse, that little that little verse, that little sentence there, very interesting. Well, it was, it was, uh, well, the skeptics say that the scriptures were written several generations after. This Correct. is the same generation. Correct. This if is... not, it's one. But, it's only 20 years, so that's still, I mean, when you look at the timeline. That's as old as Eric. 20. When you look at the timeline that he discussed last week, uh, I mean, this is all within 20, maybe 30 years of Christ walking on the earth, which means, uh, yeah, they were present, and their testimony and the evidence that we have shows that even though we don't have the original manuscripts because they crumbled, we do have manuscripts. And it shows that they were present during during Christ's, or shortly after Christ, uh, during Christ's walk on the earth, and after, Correct. through the throughout the first century. Now, I want to do this here. Have you ever had difficulty digesting information that was, on, that was, only presented in one, meta, one way? For example, 
in auditory or written form. Have you ever, has anybody ever in here had a problem digesting or understanding information when somebody only said it? Or you only seen it? Has anybody ever had that issue? Um, well, what comes to my mind is uh, not that it doesn't deal with the scriptures. It deals with uh, no, no, no. I'm talking strictly dealing with the scripture. Like whether we're using the Bible or Brother David's preaching or we're looking at the PowerPoint. Has anybody ever had a problem understanding or remembering what was discussed from the Bible? Yes. I think that's... I mean, that's... Jesus remembering. <laughs> now, I'm going to flip that around. Has anybody ever had a problem in the world understanding something that somebody from the world says? All the time. Yeah. Now, as we... I, I want to I differentiate these very simply. Do you have a harder time understanding the words of Christ... Or do you have a harder time understanding the words of men? I think it's the latter. The words of Jesus. That, are... that's, let's take a vote. How many people think it's harder to understand what the world says versus what Christ says? The world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a trust factor. There you go. That's, that's what I was looking for. You know, I mean, when you when you read the scriptures, you know that they are inspired by God, and you can believe them. You know, does that mean you shouldn't search the scriptures that we're, as we're told to do? No, it's just it's a trust factor, at least with me anyway. Same way with me. Yeah, it's a trust factor. Now, anybody, Terry? Sometimes it's not always easy to understand what the scripture says point in case there's probably 50 different doctrines that come out of here that people teach how to be saved if it was that easy everybody would be doing the same thing he's not trying to fool us but sometimes you've got to search and have an open mind if you don't do that you're not going to grasp it I have true. I found it. I found a passage that kind of correlates with the, the question. Romans chapter three. The subtitle is "All the world is guilty." Um, I'm just going to start reading down to four, one through four. Can you read through five? Yeah. Then, what advantage has the Jew or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I am speaking in human terms. Thanks for reading that. That was going to be my next scripture. Thanks, Joe. Terry? The apostles were put in, what, like three years or something like that. And he taught them over and over and over, and they still didn't grasp it until the resurrection. So that tells you something. Correct. And he is it, okay? <laughs> I mean, he is the God. He's Alpha and Omega. Now, and I think that's important for us to realize as we study 
not only this book for our lessons in Bible class, but as we also study our own Bibles, and not only when we study our Bibles and study for our class, how about teaching the world? Can we not put that in our call out bag as well? What do you guys think about that? Putting that in your call out bag. Take that with you when you go out into the world to teach the world about how amazing God is and how great Christ is. Yesterday, Pam and I had the opportunity to uh, meet a young man who served us at a restaurant in Canton. And his name, his first name was Judah. Mm -hmm. I've never run across a name like Judah. His middle name was Emmanuel. I don't know what his last name was. But I was, uh, I was uh, quite interested in his name and I asked him about that and then we we got to talking a little bit and uh, I said you know he said well you know it is a, a, a biblical name I'm going yeah it is uh, and I told him I was a student of the scriptures and we talked a little bit even though he was very busy and then I said uh, I asked him about Jesus's name and I said, did you know that was a common name back then? Just like Simon was. And he said, oh, really? Yeah. And Joshua is also, because Jesus was also called Yeshua, which is a root. Now, is, is Jesus, this is, this is a language thing, is that a, Yeshua is Hebrew. What's Jesus? It's Yeshua. But is that just a translation? Jesus would be the translation. Yeshua would be the translation. Yeshua, yeah. Yeah. So, and he found that interesting, I guess, well, now you got something to look at. You have something to look at. Or consult the oracle. And he knew exactly what I was talking about. <laughs> Now, if you'll pay attention to this video, we are going to be in lesson six. Perfect segue, our discussion we just had, to lesson six. Where's the volume? The volume. I'm behind you. I know. I'm turning the volume down. Thank you. Trying to. Okay. Wait a minute. It's reading it. Okay, where are we at? Six, six. Okay. There we go. Last thing go. Come on. There okay. you go. Play. Play again. Help! Help! statements of the gospel authors in any way. Now, there are two ways you could ever corroborate uh, an eyewitness's statement. One, have they been internally consistent? Do they make uh, self-refusing statements? Do they, do they uh, say things that are that I'm consistent with what they said yesterday or what they said a few minutes ago? So we're looking at all these when we talk to eyewitnesses to see if they're internally uh, consistent. A second way we might do is to say, well, is there anything other than the witness, outside of the witness, unaffected by the witness, that might corroborate the statement of the witness? So we're always looking at internal corroboration and external corroboration. Corroboration is not dependent on the witness at all. I think we can do the same thing with the gospel authors. 
So when we're talking about these two kinds of categories, internal and external evidence, and we apply this to the gospel authors, is there some way we could check these both internally and externally? Yeah, there is. Let's start with that category of internal evidence. One of the things that struck me immediately as I was reading through the Gospels for the very first time as an unbeliever was what I call unintentional eyewitness support. Unintentional eyewitness support. I've given a couple of examples of this in your participants' guide. This is when you have one witness who comes in and says something to you, offers a statement, and you're thinking to yourself, really, how in the world could that be true? Are you sure? I said, well, this is what I saw. And it's, they leave you hanging with some open, uh, unanswered question that, sure enough, you don't even get answered until you speak to a second witness a day later. And then they offer a missing piece, the detail that makes sense of the first eyewitness account. This happens all the time in criminal investigations. It is the earmark of reliable eyewitness testimony. When you have unintentional support that fills in the gaps one to the other and puzzles together and makes sense of the account. That's why we want more than one witness to tell us what happened. Something very similar happens in the Gospels. Let me give you an example of this. In one account in the Gospels, Jesus is in front of Caiaphas, and, uh, and he's being tested. And a challenge is posed to Jesus. Oh, you think you're God? Okay, how about this? Someone strikes him and he says, prophesy, Jesus. Tell us who hit you. That's the account? That's it? Yeah. Well, how far would that be for Jesus to tell the person who hit him who hit him? That would be very easy, wouldn't it? You just, look, dude, you just hit me. I just saw you do it. If all you had was that one eyewitness account, this, this idea that somehow Jesus' ability to identify his attacker shows his, his divinity, that's like, it makes no sense at all. Of course, there's another account out there, I listed it for you in your participants' guide, that tells us why this would actually be prophecy. In the second account, we learn that Jesus was blindfolded at this point. That was not offered by the first eyewitness. That was left out. So it made no sense when he first said it, but now we know he was blindfolded. The second witness puts together and fills in the gap, puzzles together. It's this unintentional eyewitness support. Now, years later, I discovered there was someone had been writing about this, even a century before I had been investigating it, and I called these the undesigned coincidences. J.J. Blunt wrote a book called The Undesigned Coincidences of the Gospels. Oh my goodness, I had never uh, even heard of those kinds of things by described that way, but I had identified these in my work forensically in the Gospels because I saw how the Gospel accounts came together in exactly the kind of way we would expect this kind of internal evidence, this kind of internal corroboration. But there's more, of course, internally, right? Did, did, for example, do the writers mention the right cities, the right names? Well, uh, why would that be important, Jim? Well, because there are other late Gospels written centuries after the life of Jesus. Did you know that? They're written in places like North Africa, different regions, and Egypt, places where people didn't know the cities around Jerusalem in Israel. They didn't know those cities by name, the small little cities. The gospel authors apparently did, though. They actually mentioned them by name, but the late heretical gospels that aren't true, they don't know those cities at all. As a matter of fact, Usually the only city that's mentioned in those is Jerusalem, the big cities. They don't know the minor cities, but the gospel authors did. Even better yet, I mentioned in a, a study that was done several years ago in which uh, a researcher looked at all the names of, 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 of men and women, Jewish men and women in the first century. Then it turns out the most popular names for Jewish men in Egypt in the first century were very different than the most popular names for men, Jewish men in Israel. And it turns out, when you do all the study, that the gospel authors get it right. They just happen to know what the most popular names for men and women were in the first century in Israel. Well, why do they know? Because they're actually reporting it at the time as they knew it. This is yet another evidence this is not late, and it's not written out of the region. These are written by people who knew the geography, who knew the cities, who knew even the names that were used for the people who lived there. But now let's take a shift and move from internal evidence to external evidence. How do we know, is there anything externally that would help us to know if um, Christianity is true as recorded in the Gospels? Pay well, attention to this. For that? Well, here's a couple of things you could use. Archaeology is one great way to uh, confirm the, the contents of the scriptures. Now, <coughs> I will tell you that all archaeology is a discipline of fractions. 
So I would never expect that every single city, every single event recorded in the New Testament, I could then find archaeological corroboration for. These are very ancient claims, and uh, all of archaeological uh, digs are just fractional. You don't even know, for example, what you're digging is necessarily biblical. You've only uncovered a fraction of the sites that are out there. Only a fraction of those have been cataloged. Only a fraction of those are actually New Testament sites. So there's a reason we would not expect to find everything. But I would expect to find something. Let me give you an interesting comparison so you can think about it. The Book of Mormon requires a thousand, uh, actually records a thousand year history on the North American continent, describing a number of civilization groups, cities, government structures, monetary systems, and people. Yet, in all the years we've tried to dig for this, we've never discovered a single foundation of a single city, a single name from the Book of Mormon, a single inscription, a single coin, nothing to corroborate the claims of that book. I wouldn't expect to see everything, but I would expect to see something. When I see nothing, I become suspicious. The claims of the New Testament are not like that. They are rooted in history, a history that's been corroborated by archaeology. Let's go one more step. If we just looked at the non-Christian authors who report something about Christianity in the uh, first uh, century, let's say, the first hundred years after the events, what would we discover? I've got a list in your participants guide of some ancient authors, Phallus, Tacitus, Marmar, Serapeum, uh, Plague. All of these are listed now in your participants guide. All I want you to do is to circle the claims about Jesus or the early Christians and to write them on that little list I've given to you to the side. I want you to see what they say about Jesus, what they say about Christians. Just circle those words and then transpose them to the list on the side. You've now just created a list of everything that non-Christians said about Jesus in the first hundred years after the fact. If you didn't have a single Christian document, you would still have that list written by non-Christians. What would you know about Jesus? It turns out you know an awful lot. That's great corroboration for us because you've got a robust description of the Christian narrative offered not by Christians in the Bible, but by non-Christians who were watching all of this in the first hundred years. That's the kind of thing we're looking for. Touch point corroboration. And remember, all corroboration is touch point. If I if I have some witness says, for example, that Jim sat here and touched this chair, and later on you fingerprint the chair, it's going to actually corroborate the claims of the witness, but the fingerprint's not going to tell you anything about what I wore. It's not going to tell you anything about what I said. So even though it's corroborative evidence, it only captures a point of the statement. Well, it turns out the internal and external evidence related to the New Testament is good touch point evidence that corroborates the claims of the New Testament author. So when we're talking about internal and external corroboration, I provided an illustration in your participants guide, right? It kind of shows that the, the broad brush strokes of the Christian narrative in the Gospels is kind of a corroborated and covered by our external corroboration. And then the, the details are then corroborated by the internal corroboration. So we're using both external and internal corroboration to get these all the details necessary to know if the narrative is true and corroborated. So now we've got two ways, two tools we've now put in, the, in our call-out bag that actually are specific to the gospel. One, they were written early enough to have been written by eyewitnesses. And two, they can be corroborated by both internal and external sources. We're getting close to determining if the gospels are in fact That had a very, lot of information in it. Did everybody pay attention? Huh? <laughs> what? All right, okay, everybody but Joe, did they pay attention? <laughs> All right. What kind of corroboration is there? There's two types. Internal okay. and external. What is internal? Um, unintentional eyewitness account. Yeah. What is external? What he said. External comes from archaeology and authors of that time period. Correct. Now.
to find that. I'm going to throw a question out. This is actually in your participants guide on 73. Imagine a car manufacturer claims a particular model in the car line gets the best gas mileage of any car in its class, which I want. <laughs> How will you seek to verify this? Question one, what resources would you consult? Brother David, how would you verify that that car got the best fuel economy? Well, I'd want to know if anybody I knew had purchased one and asked them firsthand what kind of mileage it got. So you were looking for a witness, an eyewitness testimony, correct? Okay, anybody else would have any other ideas how to do that? Consumer report. Okay. That's another resource. An author. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. There you go. Anyone else? You have it. You bought it. There you go. Find out for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Wait. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was you. Yeah. Too late. Yeah. Yeah. Loser. <laughs> yeah. Do not buy an F-250 with a king cab with an eight foot bed if you expect fuel economy. You're not going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, thinking about internal corroboration of the Gospels, what are unintentional eyewitness support? What is that? He discussed that in the film. He brought up the Jesus being smacked in the face and in the one account and then it's corroborated with another such. Yeah. Don't get me hear yourself. Okay. I thought that was on that your question? I thought that was Yeah, but yeah. that's a there's a that's a two that's there's another part to that question. Uh, eyewitness support is he was he was beat. Correct? Yeah. Okay. If I go up and I beat Joe over the head with a two by four, everybody's going to know that I walked up to Joe with a two by four and smacked him over the head. Right? You'd probably break the board and wouldn't really affect anything. But now, if, now if I blindfold Joe, and brother David hits him over the head with a two by four, and I was there, who would he blame? I wouldn't know. I'd be blindfolded. Okay. Because I could hear both of you, but I wouldn't know who hit me. <laughs> I could make a guess if I wasn't unconscious. Now, <clears throat> What is what is the purpose of the unintentional eyewitness support? What is the purpose of that? A lot of people don't realize that they might have seen something that will help with the situation. Uh, that's why a lot of times you'll hear them say, no matter how small or insignificant you think it is, let us know and we'll let you know. There it is. That's, that's, there it is. No matter how small anybody thinks evidence is, everything matters. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of they correlate. They correlate together. Correct. But then the Gospel of John doesn't have everything that's in there. John adds extra evidence to, to the... He doesn't want to go over the same thing. The, the idea is we, we know what's been written in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, so John fills in the gaps. Correct. You know, I found it interesting that 
he brought up some of the smaller cities and you know that weren't originally put in there. The authors put them in because they knew the area. You know, and, you know it's kind of like talking about the excavation of things. You know, most excavations come to nothing. People find a coin and so they start digging and they could dig for years and years and years and find nothing else. It's just the bigger ones when they do find something that you hear about. You know, they, they spend, because you can't go in with a backhoe, you know, and no. start digging <laughs> things up. You have to take time. <coughs> and normally they just, they're, they don't come to fruition at all. They just... Well, that's like the uh, the finding of the Pool of Siloam. Because, you know, the Bible talks about it, but nobody knew where it was. Archaeology found it. Anybody else have anything? Terry? You know, <clears throat> you can't sugarcoat that. We have. They don't know. <coughs> they said, we have what God wanted us to have. Mm -hmm. Correct. If He created this universe, this is nothing. This is zero to Him. Not that it's not worth something, but it's it, it's like it's there. It's to help us. Right. You know, when I was reading the uh, material in the. Uh, the book, and he talked about fractions. He talked about that in the beginning, archaeology fractions and puzzle pieces. Guess where I went to? Where? Harvey is a puzzle. A Harvey is a. There it is. It's in the book. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Job uh, twenty-six seven. The earth free floats in space. That wasn't discovered until sixteen fifty. Um, Isaiah 40, 22, the circle of the earth, that wasn't discovered until Christopher Columbus 2,000 years later. Um, it says in Psalms 8, 8, the paths of the sea. Yep. The oceanic currents weren't discovered until 1807. That's just a few. Very true. And the the the, the uh, external evidence was a Galileo who was excommunicated from the church right. for saying that the Earth revolved around the sun and not the sun yes. revolved around the Earth, and they found out later. Yeah. Yeah, he was correct. And well, let's be wrong. careful. There's still people believe in a flat earth, so. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, Eric Cornell, you'll get over that. Um, well, it's, it's interesting because when you're flying, if you go up high enough, you'll see the curvature of the earth. That's high enough. <laughs> yeah. Now, Brother Eric, would you like to close us on word of prayer? Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come here and learn from your word. Let us be able to take today's lesson, um, take our call out big out to the world, present this evidence to the people that don't know of your love, that they may be able to learn of your love and take it out more into the world to, to better serve you. In Jesus' name, 